Welcome. We're glad you found this recorded presentation by the Knox County Master Gardeners. We are a volunteer community service group affiliated with the University of Tennessee, as well as Tennessee State University and their cooperative extension programs. The mission of the Knox County Master Gardener program is to educate and serve the community using research-based information on best practices in horticulture, environmental stewardship, and integrated pest management. One of the ways we educate is through our Speakers Bureau. We normally present to live audiences four times a month, with two topics being presented twice, once on a Saturday at a county branch library and a repeat on a weekday at a county senior center. But with COVID-19, these are not normal times. During May, all four of our regular county venues were closed. The duration of those closures is expected to be eight weeks. And because of our affiliation with the University of Tennessee, we are banned from any public gathering of any size until August 1. So after sitting on the sidelines during April and May, we have found an alternate way to present the talks that we had on the schedule for June and July. It is likely that we will continue this alternate delivery method in August. We hope to be back in front of live audiences for September and October, and if we are, we plan to record those sessions. If group gatherings of up to 50 people are still prohibited, we will complete our planned schedule using this new format. On the slide, you see our web website address and a portion of our website homepage. The website provides information on Knox County Master Gardener projects and activities, and includes a calendar of events. All of our Speakers Bureau talks are on this calendar and include the name of the presenter, the topic, and a brief description. For the talks given in this alternative method, you will also find the link to where the recorded presentation can be found. Thanks again for finding this particular recording, and now let's get started with the actual presentation. Hey guys, this is Erin Sapp with the Knox County Extension Master Gardeners. Welcome to my talk on expanding your herb horizons. Uh, this talk is just a little bit different from some of the herb talks that we've done in the past. Um, we've previously done a number of kind of more beginner oriented herb talks. And in this one, we're going to be focused a little more specifically on intermediate level herbs. They may need a little bit of uh, different care, extra care than what you might be used to. I will provide uh, kind of cursory information in terms of uh, kind of the basic how to's and direct you to good sources for those things, but I don't have time to cover all of the basics with this one. I want to focus on these uh, more unique herbs and how to, how to get your hands on them, how to take care of them. Um, so that's kind of the, the layout of this. We're going to start out with a couple of basics to ground you and to cover some basic vocabulary. And then we will move into the main of it, which is going to be all of these more unique herbs, something, something a little different to put into the garden. As I mentioned before, my name is Erin Sapp, and I thought I might as well introduce myself since we're not in person. Um, I am 31 years old. I've lived in Knoxville my entire life, and I first got into growing herbs that would help with anxiety in my uh, early 20s. Um, since then, it definitely has gotten to be more than a hobby. I uh, joined the Master Gardeners, of course, seeking better training, volunteer opportunities, uh, and uh, definitely some like-minded spirits, and I absolutely found all of those things. It's very nice to meet all of you, and I, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Just as a little disclaimer, um, just because there, there seems to be some confusion on this sometimes, I am not a doctor, I am not a nutritionist, I'm not someone to tell you what to put into your body, and I'm not advocating for herbal medicine as much as I'm simply instructing you on how to care for these plants because they are unique, they're very special, and they're fascinating to have in your garden. Um, 
So just kind of to get all of that out of the way. There are several definitions for herbs as well, depending on what sources you go to. Uh, broadly speaking, however, herbs are plants that are useful to humans for their culinary or medicinal assets. Um, and we've been using herbs for over 5,000 years. One of the oldest known herbals is a Chinese list that dates back to 3000 BC. And most likely this is simply the first time that it was put into writing. Um, so obviously there's been a lot of information that's been put down over the years. Some of it's going to contradict other parts of it. Um, and that, you know, that's just kind of par for the course and we're all still learning. Some of the information on these herbs, especially these more unique herbs, is limited. And uh, we're just kind of waiting on science to find out what's true and what's not. For the purpose of this talk, we will be discussing herbs as plants. Uh, I know that a lot of herb books will definitely include fungus. Um, I know uh, Tremetes versa color turkey tail is an, like a known antiviral. It's, it's fascinating. We don't have time to cover it in 40 minutes. Uh, so I will only be talking about plants today. Just to get started, I have, uh, and, and you know, it was kind of a nice, safe beginner ground, basil. Basil is the quintessential summertime herb. It's one of my favorites. It's great in pesto. It's good in everything, in my opinion. Um, and it's got a number of good vocabulary words for us. It's classified as an annual. That's a plant that survives only one growing season before producing seed. Uh, and that's totally normal for these plants. Um, you can collect the seed when it bolts, which is when it produces flowers. And um, it's very easy to start from seed as well. You can also uh, buy it as a start, which is a, a young plant, or as a fully grown plant ready to be harvested. Uh, and basil is also a non-native. It's one of these that are, um, it's not invasive, it's just not a plant that developed and evolved in our area, so it's not something that's uh, going to survive here on its own. There's also plenty of insects, fungi, bacteria to control it and keep it in line. And with basil, it's also a good opportunity to talk about harvesting. Excuse me. Um, you uh, have some good basic harvesting tips here. First is leave some for later. You want your plant to keep producing, so if you chop it down and it has to struggle to grow all the way back from the ground, uh, it's probably not going to give you as much as if you were to take a smaller amount and let it keep producing more leaves and uh, more flowers for you. You also want to cut cleanly, avoid long strips, like when you tear a leaf off and it pulls a strip down the side of the plant, or messy cuts. The more openings that there are, the more injuries the plant has, the more chance for infection, just like us. <clears throat> Check for pests and disease. You can double up when you're harvesting, just scout and harvest at the same time. A good example of this would be downy mildew. Because it's on usually on the underside of the leaves, it's uh, a little harder to spot when you're just kind of wandering through the garden. Um, so when you're harvesting, you're more likely to notice it. And it's definitely not something that I like to put in my pesto. Um, so it's something to keep an eye out for so you can treat the plant if necessary or remove it to keep it from infecting other plants. And downy mildew is definitely a big one this time of year because we have a very moist, warm environment and that is what that fungus loves. Also while harvesting, you can deadhead flowers. Um, and that's kind of plant specific. Not every herb needs this, but uh, a lot of herbs where you're harvesting the leaves or the roots, if you remove the flowers, it prolongs your harvest time and uh, it increases the essential oils in other parts of the plant. So, uh, plants like basil and cilantro, you know, when they bolt, they're done. So if you start pulling off flowers, it's going to continue to produce uh, nice tasting leaves for longer versus after it's bolted, the leaves become generally uh, unflavorful and not very useful to you in your, in your kitchen. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm fighting allergies. Y'all will have to bear with me. Um, 
Additionally, you can also clean your tools between harvests and between plants. It's a really good practice to develop. It helps you keep from transferring diseases between plants. Um, and it's a good way to kind of keep an eye on how your uh, tools are doing as well. It kind of gives you the opportunity while you're cleaning them to make sure that they're nice and sharp and that'll help you to cut cleanly as well. <clears throat> Harvesting roots is something that I wanted to cover specifically because there's a couple of these more specialized herbs that are um, uh, harvested specifically for their roots, and so we just want to develop good practices with that. And generally speaking, you want to treat them the same as you would a carrot, you know? You get it out of the ground, you don't want to leave a bunch of dirt on it, so you want to clean it thoroughly. Uh, some of them, you can do this by giving them a, a, a bath, like a cold water bath and uh, making sure to dry them thoroughly afterwards. Some of them you need to scrub. It's a great idea to have a little brush on hand for this. There's a couple of little tools that you can find. Um, I've located them online. I don't think I've ever found them at a store myself, um, but that you can use for that practice. And with roots, as well as with the uh, aerial parts of the plant, it's a good idea to leave about a third of it uh, so that it can continue producing for you. Some of them, if you take pieces of the roots, you can actually replant them in different places and they will produce an entire clone of that original plant. And similarly, you can also replant daughters where appropriate. A lot of plants like uh, strawberries or rosemary or valerian, you're able to uh, take parts of that plant in order to create the daughter. We talked about layering um, with something like strawberries specifically, they'll actually put out runners and those will grow their own new plants and you can just pop them off and replant them in other areas. It's a great way to have a thriving crop in different parts of your garden. And while you're doing this, you, uh, as you would with the top of the plant, keep an eye out for anything that might have infested the roots like grubs or worms. And then for storing them, you want to make sure that they're good and dry because that's critical to keep them from developing mold or rot and store them in a cool, dry area to maximize storage time. This can be challenging here, so if there's any issues with it, don't blame yourself. Often enough, it's just because it's so humid. And uh, as a, a final note as well, I would also say it's important to remember where you're harvesting. If you are in your garden and you have total control over it, all well and good. That's fantastic. Harvest away. If you know that your neighbor's cats have been coming over and scatting in your garden, it's um, not necessarily something that you want to be consuming in any capacity. Same with if there was some kind of chemical poured nearby. You just want to be careful, especially with herbs, which are things that you're potentially going to be putting into your body um, or onto your skin, what it is that you're harvesting along with your plants. Oh, and I'm sorry, additionally, it's recommended to harvest in the morning after the dew has dried, but before it gets really hot, because that's when most of the essential oils are most concentrated in the plant. And uh, this harvesting rule applies really to any part of the plant as well. Our second example is rosemary. And rosemary is the most wonderful plant. It, it contains one of the strongest essential oils we're able to get to easily. It's prolific, it's very easy to grow, and very hardy here. There's a number of cultivars that do very, very well here. You can find starts of it virtually anywhere. Um, and with that, there comes the kind of addendum to avoid neonics, <laughs> neonics sorry, if, um, if at all possible, only because it's not good for our pollinators. It's a broad spectrum insecticide that really doesn't need to be in use and it's been proven a number of times that it's uh, harmful to the environment. So if you can get these plants usually from a nursery rather than a big box store, it's a safer bet. Rosemary additionally needs very little help. It doesn't have a ton of pests. It does not have a ton of diseases. Um, and it's uh, definitely got really potent compounds in its essential oils. This is one of the herbs where we can definitively prove that it has been shown to help improve memory. It's an antibacterial and it has other great benefits. It's a very simple herb, but it's a very useful one. Uh, 
uh, rosemary propagation. This is one of those plants that is um, super, hmm, I wouldn't say prolific, but it's very easy to propagate. Um, you can take with this, and everybody knows about starting clones from cuttings, which is just when you clip off one of their little branches and take off a couple of the bottom leaves, put it in water in a jar, maybe put a Ziploc bag over the top, it'll start growing roots for you. It's fantastic. Um, you could also do something called layering, which is when you take the, a branch from the plant and you pull a couple of leaves off the center of it, bury it in the ground, and top it with a rock so that you can see the end of that plant sticking out a little further in the soil. And then it will actually grow roots in the soil. You can disconnect it from the mother plant and you have a, a nice clone of the original plant to move wherever you want it. These are just the tried and true methods. You can also certainly um, propagate by seed. That's always an option. Uh, sometimes they're more challenging than others and rosemary just happens to be very, very simple in terms of uh, starting from clones. And then additional planting instructions. This is a slide that I'm going to refer back to further on in our talk and uh, it's very handy. It's just a, a very, very basic look at planting instructions and we have other talks that go into a little more detail on this. We've also got um, a number of resources online or in books to help you get your plants into the ground with their best possible start. And different plants have different requirements. So I, um, I don't really have time in this talk to get in depth deeply with this, but you can read the slide. Uh, you can certainly refer back to it after the talk's been recorded. Um, and it will kind of help you get a good idea of the, the very basics of planting. And this is just one little note that I wanted to add. Um, when you're shopping for plants at a nursery or at a garden center, you can absolutely pull the pot down a little way so that you can take a look at the plant's roots. Um, because sometimes, you know, it may not be the fault of the retailer, it may not even really be the fault of the nursery, uh, but plants can get root bound. They will grow prolifically for whatever reason, or they are just left there too long. And the, you can tell that it's grown to exactly fit its container because there just wasn't enough room for it. And the, the roots in this, in this stage will actually choke the plant and will cause it to die. Some of them are more sturdy than others, but uh, you know, ultimately this is not a desirable thing to see in a plant. This is going to be the start of our next section of this talk. So um, I just thought that this would be a really nice point to end on for this first half. This is a really beautiful acrylic painting that I found. It's actually in a museum in Canada. It's by Christy Bill Court, and I hope she doesn't mind me using it. Um, it just really nicely encompasses a beautiful ecosystem, and I thought that some of these plants actually looked a little bit like some of the plants in our talk today, so it seemed perfectly appropriate. Um, keep an eye out for part two of this herb talk, and I look forward to chatting with you about it then as we go into a little more depth on these more. Hello everybody, uh, this is Erin Sapp again with part two of Expanding Your Herb Horizons with the Master Gardeners. Um, this is the, in my opinion, the more exciting part of this talk. We're going to get into the plants, uh, the more unique plants for your garden and um, discuss their growing needs and some more unique qualities that they may have. Just as we get into this, I'm going to definitely focus more on the Latin names of these plants because with a lot of them, uh, you may run into trouble in terms of common names. Some of them have dozens of different names that you may run into. Um, so it's important to have a grasp of what the Latin names of these plants are, what families they're in. It can help you as you're seeking them out in different locations. Uh, just as an example of some of the confusion you can run into, our state tree, Liriodendron tulipifera, 
is known collectively as tulip poplar, yellow poplar, or tulip tree, depending on who you ask or where you are. Um, and I mean, for instance, tulip tree could also refer to a tulip magnolia. There's, there's a dozen different trees that have tulip in the name, so you need to be careful when you're seeking these plants out. This is a great place to find uh, different and common herbs as Tennessee Naturescapes. Um, also, we've got a couple of these places around town. Tennessee Naturescapes and Aaron's Meadow Herb Farm are actually in kind of the same area. They're both up towards Clinton. There's also Native Plant Rescue Squad, which is a fantastic group. They, um, they're a volunteer organization. They go to places where it's reported that there's going to be a destruction of a habitat and they save the native plants that have been uh, existing there and pot them up and put them out for sale to the public so that they can actually redistribute them and give them a, a second chance at life, excuse me. Nurseries in our area will frequently have sections for native plants and for native herbs as well. And these will generally have a better chance of surviving in our area. I've focused a little bit on them as well for this talk, just because they're, they tend to be hardier than a lot of what you can pick up um, in terms of uncommon non-native plants. Uh, and as well, I mentioned before, you know, with mail orders, you want to take care with your sources. Some of them will occasionally get flagged for one reason or another if they have some infection, some virus on their plants. Um, and you can usually pretty easily Google that information. You can get ratings and reviews and uh, see what, what people's experiences have been. And additionally, if you go to a smaller location, and they don't have an herb that you're looking for, see if they've ever carried it or have ideas where you might find it. Sometimes they can even order it for you from a really good reputable source. This is the first of our unique herbs and I thought I would start out with one that a lot of people will recognize. This is comfrey. Um, and we've got two different comfreys here, so you can see that they're distinct in terms of their leaf shape and in terms of their flowers. Our native comfrey is the one on the right. This is Cynoglossum virginianum, and it has these lovely little pale blue flowers. You'll see these pretty frequently in the woods around here when you go hiking, especially if it's in bloom. They're absolutely gorgeous, and they spread pretty easily in a lot of areas, so you'll find just a, a small ocean of them from time to time, and they're really pretty when they're blooming. The official uh, Symphytum officinale is also an absolutely gorgeous plant. You can see that it's thriving right there next to that pond on the left. And this plant is what will typically have a lot more information online and in uh, any of the resources that you find because this is what most people will use for herbal medicine. There's um, a certain amount of debate as to whether or not you could use them interchangeably. Um, I'm not here to really get into that debate right now. We're just talking about how to grow them and I think that both of them have a place in the garden. This is a, a bit of a wall of text, so bear with me, but it's mainly so that you can refer back to it if you have questions. Um, but uh, comfrey is, is really a pretty simple plant to grow. This, this shouldn't be that intimidating for you. It's mainly, you know, letting you know what its needs are. And uh, importantly at the top here, it's uh, definitely a very enthusiastic plant. It's one that will self-seed and it will grow back from broken roots. It also has a massive taproot. It's one, uh, once it's in place, it's pretty hard to get rid of, so you need to be quite sure that you do want it. Um, there are sterile species purportedly available of this plant. I've not grown one myself, but if you can find a sterile species that can help with the self-propagation, so that might be something to seek out. Comfrey will thrive in clay soil or rich soil. It does prefer lots of moisture, so if you've got a, you know, kind of a more moist area of your yard, it can uh, absolutely tolerate partial shade. It does prefer full sun and will thrive there. 
and uh, it's right in the middle of its comfort zone here. So it's definitely uh, with both zones three to nine, we're 6B, 7A, depending on your little microclimate, we're definitely at the land of those. Um, but Comfrey is pretty happy anywhere in our area. If you decide to go with seeds and a lot of people do. Um, germination is a little faster in a greenhouse where you can control the environment. Usually takes about 10 days, but it can take as long as 30 if you're direct sowing and you don't have obviously control of the weather. You can also take root cuttings or crown cuttings um, and uh, plenty of places will have starts of comfrey if you're going to like an herb farm. I know Aaron's Meadow has definitely had it in the past. I don't know if they have it every year, um, but that's a good source for it. If you can find a small plant and get it started from there, then you will have all the starts you'll ever need within a season or two. Uh, comfrey does like a sweet soil, so if you feel like you want to encourage it a little faster, you can add some compost or some aged manure. Um, you certainly don't ever want to use fresh manure in a garden, especially a garden where you may be consuming some of the plants. Um, it, it can harm the plants and it can, you know, certainly lead to disease or, or any number of other problems. These plants are very greedy for nutrients. So if you fill it with amendments like aged manure or compost, it will absolutely take over. It loves it, it'll, it'll eat it up. And for this reason too, um, comfrey is frequently used as compost itself as a source of nitrogen and potassium for different plants. There's a lot of organic groups that will use it in their um, orchards in particular. They'll actually chop and drop the leaves and let it compost there. You know, it's just a, a natural green manure. And that way they put all of that nutrition back into the ground and it supports their trees. Oh, and one more thing. Uh, when you're harvesting comfrey, it's important to wear gloves just because they've got hairy stems and hairy leaves and that hair can be a little prickly. I know uh, a couple of people who've gotten little rashes from it. It's mainly just because of the hairs irritating the skin. Our next uh, plant is jewelweed, also called touch me not. It's a member of the impatien family. It's impatiens capensis. And this is an absolutely beautiful plant. Uh, you will see them in wet areas in the mountains around here. It's uh, pretty common. I know uh, I've seen it around Frozen Head. I've seen it in the Smokies at Big South Fork. Definitely went out hiking. And the fun, the fun story that goes along with jewelweed is anywhere that it's growing is usually pretty close to where poison ivy is growing. And people will tell you you can use jewelweed to help remove the oils from poison ivy. Um, and I, I know that there have been a couple of uh, small studies done on this. I'm not sure if there's been a larger one. I've uh, certainly tried it myself and I have found that I've, on those hikes, I've come back and not had any poison ivy. Now, some people say that it's just the water content. You're able to kind of wash the oils off and other people say, you know, maybe it just wasn't your day for poison ivy. You know, there's there's naysayers out there and there's people who are all about it. But that's that's the mythology and it's part of what makes jewelweed a very interesting plant. Um, as I said before, they tend to like wet areas. They love deep shade and they love soggy soil. And a lot of our gardeners, you know, we come to a a dead end with that because there's most plants that we're thinking of for our herb gardens in particular, they tend to be full sun. So jewelweed is a, a wonderful plant to put into a wet area, especially if you've got a small pond or a creek. They tend to grow about three to five feet tall and they have these really pretty silvery leaves and juicy stems. Uh, the, the stems can also have a bit of a pink tip which adds to their look which is really nice. When the flowers are done and they have those lovely little orchid looking flowers, they can be either this nice yellow or kind of an orange and yellow. When they're done blooming, they'll actually form a little capsule that'll bust and spread seeds around. And that's where the name Touch Me Not came from. Excuse me, if your soil is poor, um, it's a great idea to add some rich compost or some manure. Um, 
and you want it to be as consistently wet as possible. That's how this plant will be happiest. So if you've got somewhere where there's a lot of drainage, that's a great place to put jewelweed. It's pretty easy to plant by seed. Uh, it's a good idea though to stratify the seeds if you want them to grow with any speed. Sometimes the seeds will just sit there for ages if you don't. Um, all you have to do is store it in the fridge for, eh, they say two months. I've had it work for me a little faster than that, I think, but you know, that's, that's the advisement, so we're going to stick to it. Put the seeds between two damp but not super wet paper towels and set inside a plastic bag before storing. Uh, it's a little bit different from saving the seeds, which would require them to be dry, but you're basically trying to simulate winter in Tennessee so that they will um, be ready to grow when it starts to feel warm to them again. And when you're ready, you just scatter them over the surface of your amended soil after the last frost. Make sure that it's warm enough for them. They usually prefer about 70 degrees. You don't need to rake them in, uh, but you do need to water them very lightly. They do need light to germinate. And uh, initially it's recommended to weed a little bit around them, but once they get to, let's say about a foot tall, they'll start crowding out weeds themselves and that makes them a kind of nice weed control for wet areas. This is toothache plant. Um, it's actually got a couple of different Latin names. It's got Acmela oleracea and Spilanthes oleracea. And Spilanthes is the one that I've been most um, uh, uh, acclimated to. It's the name that I know best. But um, I did find Acmela oleracea as I was looking up information, so I thought I would include it. It's also called the bullseye plant and the eyeball plant, and you can see why. Uh, it's got these beautiful little kind of uh, button-like flowers that look just like little crazy eyeballs. Um, and the reason it's called the toothache plant is because you can pop those little flowers off and chew on them and it will produce this numbing, tickling kind of kind of sensation as though you're, you've gone to the dentist. <laughs> they are absolutely gorgeous, compact, tropical plants. That's, it's a thought that they're native to Brazil or somewhere in South America and they only grow as annuals here. It's not something that will come back after a winter. They are a fantastic conversation starter and they work really well in a container because they don't get really large, they only get to about 15 inches tall and wide. Uh, when you're growing toothache plant from seed, and usually you will be, it's very hard to find a start of this plant. I'm honestly not sure if you can do it in this area, but the seeds are easy, so it's not a big deal. And it only takes, I mean, maybe maybe 10 to 15 days for them to germinate, so you'll, you'll know pretty quickly if you've got a good batch of seeds from whatever your source was. I know that um, Johnny's definitely has these seeds from time to time. I've seen them at Baker Creek Heirloom. And uh, I believe high mowing has had them before as well. Uh, but you want to sow about a quarter inch deep in moist rich soil, space them to about six to eight inches apart, and then thin to about 12 inches. I'm oh, sorry, six to 12 inches when the plants are a little bit taller. There are some sources that I found that have advocated not covering the seeds uh, because they uh, suggest that it allows better germination. I have always direct seeded in a quarter inch, and it seems to work just fine for me. You may want to experiment a little bit and see what works best for you. They do need to be planted after the last frost if you're going to have them outdoors. They are very sensitive to cold, so they will die very easily or be frostbitten and not as attractive for your garden. And as I said before, they are treated as annuals here, so once they have seeded, they will die off. You want to make sure that they're in full sun and they do prefer nice rich soil. So this is elderberry um, and elderberry Sambucus canadensis is the American elderberry. You can find different cultivars. Um, there are dwarf varieties as well if you don't have a ton of space. The uh, American one can get pretty tall and pretty wide so it does need a little bit of room. And this is an amazingly useful plant. It is 
one of my all-time favorite herbs because it is very hard to hear. It's very abundant. It's super useful. And they're just pretty. I really like the look of the plant. It's got these big umbels with tiny white flowers that eventually turn into these small black berries. And they have uh, pinkish stems as well, which I think just adds to that look. It's also um, been experiencing a bit of a renaissance as a flavor in the U.S. It, um, I believe it maintained that popularity in Europe, but for years elderberry was almost unknown in the U.S. But now you can find it all over the place in syrups, uh, in liqueurs. I know uh, Saint Germain is one that's been very popular. Um, wines and various flavorings all over the place. It's been recognized as a great source of vitamin C, so you'll see a lot of the uh, syrups pop up around flu season and people seem to get good use out of them. Uh, it does reach about 15 feet tall and sometimes it seems to get just as wide. It's got a kind of sprawling habit to it. They are often visible on roadways and right around, uh, it's June here, so right now it's uh, blooming but it should be burying anytime soon. And they're very recognizable because they have these huge white umbels of flowers. Elderberry is usually at full productive maturity within uh, four years or so. It does produce fruit earlier than that, it's just not at max capacity. Uh, make sure if you do if you do decide to eat the fruit, it's a good idea to to go ahead and make your syrup or remove the seeds at any rate because the seeds are poisonous. They need to be removed before any products are made with the fruit. And elderberry does prefer rich soil um, and slightly acidic pH. I think these are really if you just want maximum production from your plant. It's a very hardy plant. I've, I've popped one into the clay soil and it seems perfectly happy there. Um, it's very easy also to start new plants with cuttings. We chopped a bunch of branch, branches off of uh, one of the plants at the farm here and we're able to get them to root very easily and with only just a little bit of help from some rooting hormone. It just speeds up the process of rooting for that plant. For this reason, I generally don't don't start them from seeds myself. Uh, the The seeds are doable, but the plants are for sale so widely, and it's so easy to take cuttings and root them that it, it's almost unnecessary to go through the trouble of starting the seeds. The UT plant sale often has several different types. I've definitely gotten a uh, a dwarf variety that had beautiful purple leaves at one point. And it went quick, so if you do decide that you want to go that route, make sure you get there early because you want to make sure that you get your hands on what you're looking for. When you're planting a, uh, a grown plant that has the root ball attached, be sure you follow the general rules on slide 10 or find a good source for that information. Your soil should need minimal amendments, but the plant will thrive with anything you put in there to help it out. They are resistant to deer. Um, it doesn't seem like deer really care much for them. Uh, maybe it's just because the leaves are a little tougher. But um, you don't tend to see a lot of deer pressure on elderberries. You can also mulch the plants. And this is helpful because there's a particular kind of fly that can cause the fruit to be um, impacted ne negatively. The plant will produce fewer fruits and they'll be kind of mutated. That's the Drosophila. And there's also a rust that is a concern for elderberries. I have not seen it here as much, um, never on my plants, but if you look up images, it's definitely pretty nasty looking. You do not want to have that on your plants. So if you um, are curious about that, there is a link in my sources at the end that will provide more information on elderberry rust. And this is um, another element to bring up as well. There's a few of these plants that have some lookalikes that are worth looking up. And that's something you can do. You can pretty much just Google whatever the plant name is, the Latin name especially, lookalikes, and that can help you locate different plants that may be similar looking to uh, what you're trying to put into your garden. This one in particular is a big one around this, this area. And when, um, when elderberries start to fruit, 
is about the same time that this plant starts to fruit. And so we tend to get a lot of questions about this. Is this elderberry? No, this is pokeweed. And poke is a, is a poisonous plant, so we want to avoid accidentally ingesting any of these berries or any part of this plant. There are some people that swear by poke salad, but for the purpose of this talk, this is a poisonous plant. Don't eat the berries. Marshmallow is our next plant, and this is a really cool one, and it's an ancient one. Uh, there are records of the ancient Egyptians growing this plant, Althea officinalis, and they would actually take the roots, they would chop them up, and it produced this very thick mucilage, it, and they would chew it, and it had a sweetness to it when they, uh, when they wanted a treat. Now we've come quite a long ways from that. Um, marshmallow, the candy, actually was initially made using that same mucilage, but now we just use gelatin, so the plant is uh, almost purely decorative. But, you know, it's related to hollyhocks. It's a beautiful plant, and so there's absolutely a place for it in your garden. Marshmallow uh, can be treated as a perennial here. It's one that is uh, very happy and frequently wet, moist soil, um, and they do tend to like a little sand, so you might amend your soil as well wherever you're going to place it. They tend to grow to be about three feet tall. I've seen them get a little taller than that, but, you know, like a hollyhock, it kind of tapers off towards the top. And they have flowers all along that length that are just this lovely pale white with just a little bit of a darker color towards the center, kind of purplish pink. They prefer partial sun. Or they can tolerate shade or full sun, so you've got a pretty happy camper no matter where you put it. It will, it will prefer a little bit of dappled sunlight though. And if you scatter your seeds in late summer or early fall, you can rake them in. Um, you can direct seed them. Germination tends to be kind of variable. It's definitely a plant that you don't get 100% germination, um, and sometimes it can take uh, I've, I've heard as long as months, but I've never had that much trouble with it. It tends to take a little bit of time, maybe a couple weeks, but uh, you should start to see sprouts after a little while. Uh, marshmallow is tolerant of a wide range of pH, but it really prefers that nice rich soil regardless of the pH. And so if you add some compost and mulch the plants, that'll keep them very happy for you. They do not tend to need a lot of fertilization, and they're largely pest-free. You, you'll see a little pressure from flea beetles. There's um, the chance for some mildew, uh, downy mildew, powdery mildew, but Generally speaking, these are, these are pretty happy and, and easy to grow. Additionally, if you decide that you want to plant in trays or in flats and ensure a better germination rate, you can stratify marshmallow seeds because they do need a simulated cold period. If you sow them in flats and put them in the fridge, just keep your uh, potting medium moist and check it regularly. As soon as they germinate, just make, go ahead and pop them right outdoors, or uh, keep them in until after the last frost. So this is a, this is a truck full of chickens. Um, these are some harder herbs to grow, and I felt like it would be kind of fun to include them at the end, just as a kind of, you know, if you're looking for something that's uh, definitely going to be a challenge. Uh, some people definitely want that special plant, something that's really going to stand out in their yard, something that's uh, not necessarily going to grow very well on its own or may need some special treatment. These are some good options for, for that challenge plant. So this is Stag Sumac, Rustafina. And uh, this is a very common, actually, wild plant in our area, and maybe you've never even thought of it as potentially a, an herb before. Um, but sumac is a really special sort of plant because the berries are useful in a wide variety of culinary uses. They have a citrus sort of flavor to them. They're kind of tart and lemony. It's not quite as intense as uh, lemon juice, 
but it's it's just got this really wonderful complex flavor so some people will make sumac aid with it like lemonade um, and it tastes wonderful. I've, I've had it several times in a couple of versions. I had a, a raspberry sumac aid and a, a strawberry, and they tasted just fantastic. Um, so a lot of people will grow them for this. In the Middle East, they actually have a different kind of sumac. It's called Rus coriaria. And this is the one that's a little bit better known culinarily because they will actually over there take and even have the ground up ber uh, berries in there in a salt shaker on the table right next to the salt and pepper because they like to flavor their cuisine with it. Sumac is also host to multiple butterfly species. Uh, you've got pictures here of the banded hair streak, Ceterium calanus, and the spring azure, Celestrina lidon. Absolutely beautiful little butterflies. Um, and the striped hair streak looks quite a bit like the banded, so I just didn't include a picture of it. The uh, sumac is also a favorite of birds and is used as an emergency food by them in the winter time, especially because the berries will hang around for quite a while after many of their other food sources have dried up. Um, and I've even heard of some other animals using it as a food source, but the birds are definitely the big one. So if you want year-round appeal in your garden, something that you can watch with your binoculars, this is a great one to keep around. Let's see, I mentioned that. If you've never had it before, do be careful um, of uh, trying this particular plant. You may think, you know, I've never had an allergy before, but uh, there's always a first time. So obviously you don't want to drink a whole gallon of the sumac tea before you've, uh, before you've tasted it. Staghorn sumac is native to the eastern United States. Uh, you've possibly already got some on your property. Um, a lot of people consider them weed trees because they just don't know how useful it is. It's a extremely sturdy, hardy tree. They can handle almost anything. They can handle pollution, dicing salts, um, they don't mind drought, they don't mind a lot of water, but they really don't like soil compaction and they do tend to do better in non-shady, well-draining areas. They are, given the right environment, they're happy to colonize and so they can be used for erosion control in tough areas, especially along wood, woodland borders. <laughs> If you're able to, and if you do want this tree for its fruit, uh, try to purchase plants that are already in fruit. Only the females bear fruit. So if you get a tree and it doesn't have any fruit on it after a couple of years, you may have accidentally picked up a male. They will also spread very enthusiastically via root suckers and self-seeding. So it's a good idea to have a little distance for them to travel in because if you put them right in the middle of your garden, there's a chance that they'll start um, shading out your other plants because they will spread. Planting sumac seeds can be a little trickier. Um, they need treating, but it's not stratification. They have a hard coat uh, on their seeds, and so to help them germinate more quickly, you will almost certainly damage some of them, and so you need to operate under the assumption that you need about twice as many as you think you do. You can heat some water to about 200 degrees Fahrenheit, um, being careful not to overheat it. It can kill the seeds if you overdo that. Cover a layer of seeds to about two inches and allow it to cool and then drain. Your seeds should be swollen at this point and that means that they're ready to plant. Excuse me. Plant to a depth of about a half an inch in groups of four. Make sure you water it in, of course, and then keep them moist until they germinate. You should see sprouts in two to three weeks. Germination rate is reasonable um, as long as you haven't accidentally damaged the seeds. And it's a great idea to plant them in the fall, a few weeks before the first frost, if you're not treating them. And just because this can be a bit of a, um, a question mark for some people, um, 
So poison sumac and staghorn sumac are pretty easily distinguishable. You don't need to be worried about accidentally picking one up in a nursery. Um, they have different leaves, they have different berries, so you know, don't panic, relax. We know that they are different plants. Um, staghorn sumac has very fine saw edge on its leaves, although they are the same shape as poison sumac. Poison sumac's leaves are smooth edged. Poison sumac also has small white gray berries and they tend to hang underneath the leaves of the plant. You can see in that picture on the bottom left where staghorn sumacs, which we saw previously, have these nice big panicles that stick up out of the top of the tree and they will be bright red or they will be a duller red when they get old. So these are pretty clear distinctions. Additionally, poison sumac prefers boggy areas. It prefers swamps. And so that is where you will exclusively find it. They are not common in Tennessee. There's uh, some indication that they're becoming more common as areas become swampy. Um, and as we've had very wet seasons, but they're not, they're not generally very common in our area. And just as a, a point of interest, a number, a number of toxicodendrons, so that would be your poison sumac, your poison ivy, your poison oak, they have trouble growing at elevation. So if you're above 4,000 feet and you see a tree and think it might be poison sumac, there's not a great chance of that being the case. Um, still, you know, I wouldn't go and give that tree a hug, but you're probably safe. And this is our last plant for the day, I believe. Oh no, we've got one more after this. Uh, this is ashwagandha, withania somnifera, Indian ginseng, also called winter cherry. And this is one um, I've used pretty frequently myself, although um, it's, it's not necessarily one that you want to keep on hand regularly. It's a beautiful little plant, a nice little shrub, and it has these pretty little uh, cherry looking fruits that come in, in little packets, kind of like a tomatillo, although they are not related. It originated in the drier regions of India and into Nepal, so it's northern India, southern Nepal. And uh, you can find plants as far north as China, although they're not as common there. It's in the Solanaceae family, along with tomatoes, eggplant, bell peppers, nightshade, and brugmansia. And the root powders have been used for centuries in traditional Ayurvedic medicine. There's not really adequate studies on hand to support this. It has been classed as an adaptogen, um, but it's mostly just a lack of evidence more than anything else. There's just not any data because nobody has uh, funded research on the plant. Uh, ashwagandha will get to about three feet, maybe a little bit more, and it does prefer full sun and dry conditions, and that's what makes this plant a challenge. It loves our summers and it hates our winters, and it really doesn't like our rain. Um, we do grow it as an annual, it tends to prefer 70 to 95 degree temperatures, so about the same, same time that you're putting your basil in the ground, you could be putting this in the ground. It's very drought tolerant, and it really prefers full sun. <coughs> Excuse me. It's a great idea to amend your soil. You can use some sand and pea gravel that'll help it to drain a little better if it's not already a well drained area. The plants will not tolerate standing water. If you overwater them, they will die and they will die quickly. They really need these almost, almost desert-like conditions. It needs to be quite dry for them. Um, and you want to wait until they're fully dried out before you water them again. The pH for this is also a little different from anything we've covered so far. They do prefer neutral or even slightly alkaline soils, so you may need to amend with lime or other similar um, soil amendments. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. It's a good idea to start indoors in seed trays at about 70 degrees and transplant 
after the frost. Starts are pretty well impossible to find here. I have found them at herb conferences in other states. Uh, in North Carolina, I found an ashwagandha one time. But that was a pretty rare bird. It's not likely that you'll find them around here. And they do tend to take a long time to fruit, so you want to get them started as early as possible if you want to make sure that you see those little berries. That can take up to 150 to even 180 days for them to bear their fruit. It'll take longer if we have a cooler spring and summer. Um, and the berries, just as a note, the berries are mildly toxic, so when you're planting, take care. Um, if it's somewhere where young children or animals, pets, may have access to the plants. <clears throat> this is our last plant. So this is a, a, a small favorite of mine. I've, I've really enjoyed this plant since I was a child. This is Pipsisoa, and it does share that common name with another plant of the same uh, genus, Chimophila maculata, is this plant, striped wintergreen. There's another one called Chimophila umbellata, the umbellate. Uh, wintergreen and that one is the one where we do have a little more information in terms of medicinal uses. Um, we think that both plants were used by Native Americans in traditional medicine. However, the, uh, the umbellate has for whatever reason become the more popular of the two. This one happens to be the one that lives in our area and um, so I thought that it might be helpful in terms of identification as well as for growing purposes to uh, focus on uh, Chimophila maculata. And I wanted to cover really quickly, <clears throat> um, because this plant is nearly impossible to find in a, a retail setting or even amongst friends, it's sometimes one that people are tempted to go seek out in the wild and there are rules attached to that in terms of what is safe to do, what is legal to do, and what is right for the plants to do. For your safety and for the safety of our plant populations, it's important to follow these rules. First off, and foremost, do not ever wildcraft or forage from protected areas. That would include our um, state parks and our federal parks, our reserves. These are places where plants are legally protected so that their populations can remain steady. And it is illegal to remove plants from these areas. You can be fined. Um, and if you were to really go overboard, you could face jail time as well. Uh, do not trespass. Don't go onto property that, that isn't yours. And follow the rule of thirds. When you're taking plants from an area, you need to leave enough for that colony to repopulate. So if you only see one plant, leave it there. If you see a bunch of plants, take only a limited number so that there are enough to repopulate that area. About a third is a good rule of thumb. It's a good way to be respectful to that population. Additionally, if you know that a species is endangered, don't take any of them. That plant is already having a tough enough time without having to repopulate an area <clears throat> because people took plants away that were already struggling to survive. Additionally, if you intend to use herbs as a consumable, there are places that you shouldn't source them from. A big one is next to railroad tracks. They use pretty heavily a number of different chemicals to keep the tracks clear and even a plant that seems to be growing very healthily alongside railroad tracks um, can absorb these poisons and they can be toxic to humans. You also want to be 100% sure what you're gathering and so it's a good idea often to have someone who's uh, good and experienced with you when you are out uh, selecting your plants. There are plants, like we mentioned before, that have toxic lookalikes. And just as a final note, and this is mainly just for your own protection, you know, keep an eye out for poison ivy and other hazards. Make sure you wear closed toed shoes. And uh, just generally try to be practical when you're out and about in the wild. <clears throat> so growing Pipsisawa is also challenging. Um, 
if you start it from seed, I, uh, I've never actually heard of anybody trying to do that. But generally speaking, the seeds, as, as I've understood it, have a very low germination rate. And so most people will try to take cuttings or they will remove an entire plant because it grows off of a rhizome. If you do that, it's a good idea to take some of the soil that it was growing in with it because this plant depends on a mycorrhizal relationship in order to grow properly. Um, cuttings will stand a better chance of survival this way. You need to try and create a habitat for this plant that is similar to the forest flo floor where it typically lives. A woodland shade garden with rich moist soil is key. It will not survive if you try and put it in amongst the irises or gladiolus. It, it really needs a forest to live in and so it will struggle if you try to put it outside of a, a very rich uh, composted hummus loaded area. And as we finish out here, I've got you just a nice little selection of uh, information, books, um, a couple of links that we mentioned along the way, and some favorite books of mine down here at the bottom. Um, I'm a particular fan of Stalking the Wild Asparagus by Yule Gibbons. He has a, a really wonderful sense of humor and tells a lot of stories from his childhood along the way. And uh, these others are also just wonderful sources for good information. They don't necessarily stick to exclusively herbs, but you can get some really cool information and good general growing tips and uh, propagation tips from these others as well. Thank you all very much for coming to this talk, um, <laughs> such as it is. And uh, I just wanna wish you all happy planting, good luck, and I hope that we get to see each other in person sometime soon. We hope you enjoyed this presentation and that you learned something that will help you in your gardening endeavors. Whether that means more blooms on your flowers and ornamental shrubs, attracting more pollinators to your garden, or improving your vegetable production. As we were not able to field your questions today, we want to close by offering you some ways to reach us. As you can see on this slide, we have a presence on Facebook. You may post questions to either of these Facebook pages. Feel free to upload a photo, especially if it helps to describe the problem you have. If you are not a Facebook user, you may call the Extension Office at 865-215-2340 and leave a detailed message with your question. Your question will be forwarded to a Master Gardener to research and respond to you. You may also send an email to Rylan Thompson, the Knox County Extension agent who advises the local Master Gardener program. If a photo would help to describe the problem, feel free to attach one or two. Try to keep the total attachments to less than five megabytes. You may get a response directly from Rylan, or he may route your question to a Master Gardener to research and respond to you. We are eager to return to public presentations. In the meantime, you can watch any of our recorded presentations by going to our website, finding a Speakers Bureau event on the calendar, and clicking on the link that is included within the event details. Now, let's go get some dirt under our fingernails. <laughs>